Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life with Sabine Pata. Hi everybody, this is Sabine with another episode of Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life. I am honored to have had a conversation with Eva Kasak. Eva is a pioneer in dance. She has been around the early 1970s. She practices, teaches and explores contemporary dance. She has been a formidable member of the Trisha Brown Dance Company from 1979 to 1985. She has been performing solo and collaborative work. She has been teaching in institutions across the US, Europe and Australia. She is a certified Alexander Technique. She has an MFA from Bennington College. She um, is uh, has been studying or has been long time exploring anatomical release techniques, idiokinesis, Alexander Technique, Tai Chi and Qigong Yoga. And uh, she has been super influential to many dancers over many decades uh, across the board of contemporary dance, improvisational dance, contact improvisation. And uh, we've had a fabulous conversation that actually will be presented here in two parts because we really went into the depth of the history and then also into the depth of the somatic work uh, related to contemporary dance. So here's my conversation with Eva Kazak. Hi, Eva. It's so lovely to see you. Hi, Sabina. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to uh, talk with you. Thank you. Yeah, we were just chatting before because we've had a couple of different tries to um, make this meeting possible. And uh, I, yeah, I congratulate us both for our endurance and um, yeah, for our good spirits to keep on trying. <laughs> well, I think it's so. Uh... As dancers, you need to train endurance, yeah. especially as uh, independent dance artists. You have to keep enduring and you have to keep going. And um, keeping spirits bright, well, I think as human beings, that's always useful. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I mean, we're right in, in the matter. Um, you, I remember as part of our last conversation, which ended up not recording, but which was a lovely conversation. Um, I want to talk about your history, but since we started on this, what does what do dancers need? You, I remember you sharing on the last podcast. You know, there is no ready-made jobs for us out there. There is very few jobs that have job descriptions where people can apply for it. So in a lot of ways, dancers need a lot of entrepreneurial skills in order to make a living and to find what fits for them on the job, job market. And uh, you have been around professionally for such a long time. And in a way, your life is also um, a chronicle of so many different life uh, developments within this, this dance life. So many different uh, developments from the 60s, the Judson Church Street Revolution through the 70s, 80s, release technique, the incorporation or the beginning incorporation of somatics into dance. Um, so maybe this time we start at the other end. Um, I'm wondering <laughs> what keeps you busy in your dance at this moment? What is interesting to you after such a rich life and uh, witnessing so many different developments in your career? What is, what is it that you're exploring right now? Well, um, I'd sort of like to go back a little bit to what you said. <laughs> um, you said dancers don't have a prescription, mm -hmm. but actually dancers do have prescriptions, and very often they're way out of themselves. So... Um, probably um, a, a, a better way to um, to express what you were saying is um, maybe an independent dance mm. artist or an independent dancer, mm. one who is um, looking for their own way, uh, doesn't have prescriptions uh, in in that way. 
Um, and it, it, well, you ask me about my background uh, and my long life as a dancer who has experienced many different kinds of dancerness. Um, and yeah, that, that distinction is really important for me mm. because uh, I actually came from being a dancer who worked towards a prescription mm. and mm. you know yeah. worked thank thank you for pointing that out to me because it's so it's so internalized for me mm. um obviously being an independent artist meaning that's the core of my investigation um and uh, I recognize that that's not the same path for everybody, but I think that's sort of the general field that we're in. So, yeah, I think it's a really good distinction. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the second part of your question. Yeah. <laughs> um, what am I busy with now? Um, well, it's not so different to what I was busy with uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost amazing to me that that switch, once it happened, brought along so many new possibilities for me. Mm -hmm. And how short the other part of my dancer life was mm -hmm. to how long my current way of working and my current um, explorations and connections with others uh, has been. Mm. So um, I would say that I'm still exploring who I am as the dancer I am. Mm. And um, and how I can create work and move in ways that are, um, I suppose, most honest to where I am at any moment in life. Oh. Something like that. <laughs> oh. oh, that's beautiful. Mm. <laughs> oh it's beautiful it's uh i think it's a it's a, a quest it's not just an artistic journey but it for me it sounds like it's a quest for your own inner truth through the medium of dance or through the medium of moving but what it sounds like to me is is that you are not just looking for an artistic output but you're also looking for yourself in some way in there uh, yeah, I would probably agree with that. Um, oh. I'd have to turn back to what I said. <laughs> it just rolled out. I may withdraw that. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, the self is always changing also, so we can always withdraw from that. Right. So maybe for those um, uh, of uh, my listeners who don't know you so well or who also don't know about that shift and I didn't know about that so much until the last time I talked to you. Can you describe a little bit uh, where, where sort of, uh, yeah, where you started in dance, how you were first uh, sort of be defined yourself as a dancer, and then also talking about the shift that you just mentioned, the shift that you have been busy with with the last 50 years and how that came about. And that's a very big question. So maybe we just start with your earlier, your early memories of dancing and your early development. Hmm. Well, um, I started out as a European, um, <laughs> a Central European country, um, part of the Soviet bloc, um, very much influenced by um, Central European standards of cultural. That was Hungary, right? In yes, Hungary. It's Hungary, yeah. 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 So um my very first uh experiences of 
dance, work ballet, mm. and uh, that's what I wanted to be. And that's not dissimilar to many little girls, mm -hmm. uh, even now, which horrifies me, but <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I wanted to be a ballerina and when my family shifted uh, location, we, we, well, actually we, we um, were refugees. We, we left uh, Hungary and moved to Australia. So a really big shift in culture, in language, in, um, uh, well, everything, climate, food, um, schooling you, you were relatively young uh, at the time of the of the the relocation yeah yeah i was 6 when we left hungary mm -hmm. and um uh i i continued to want to be a ballerina of course so it took my parents uh, some years to um manage to to find enough money to be able to send me to ballet classes so uh, I didn't start to dance again to take ballet classes again till I was 10 mm -hmm. uh, but my trajectory was still very clear I wanted to be a ballerina mm -hmm. and um, at the age of 19 I ended up um, uh, going to England uh, and joining London Festival Ballet Company, which was a really big, um, many corps de ballet, many soloists, uh, quite a number of ballerinas and ballerinos and um, a big orchestra that traveled with the company. So really... Um, big production. Big production, yeah. Spectacle. Very much can I can I just ask you like viscerally or even body memory wise do you remember yourself as a child and what what like what it felt like to practice ballet like what was it that that was exciting about it or or enticing about it I don't think it was so much um it was well yes I think I love to move and um I think it made made a difference that I grew up in Australia and not in Europe mm -hmm. because Australia is a big country, it's open, there's a lot of space, the weather is wonderful. So as a child, I lived a lot outside and ran around and jumped and climbed and, you know, did all those child things while um, putting my body into these forms that, well, I did it because that was the prescription. <laughs> and um, But I think it was even more than that. I think it was the, the way I was moved by music and by the kind of feelings that that brought up in me and okay. that I, <laughs> that I wanted to I my my body felt like it wanted to express something of what was going on in me yeah so, and do you feel like I'm always interested in how people grew up grow up because it feels like it's such a it often sets so much of a tone for their further life and so uh, did you when you were training ballet as a teenager then in Australia you parallel to that you were still out in nature you were still um like sort of unwinding maybe also some of the 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 stringent training so you had enough of both elements Sort sure. of the discipline and and the the natural way of moving or releasing some of that tension. Yes, of course, and it wasn't. Um, yeah, I mean, I I could express my 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 movement through 
very ordinary, very free kind of movement. Um, and it wasn't stringent uh, training because, you know, I went to ballet class once a week. And later, I went twice a week. Oh. However, um, when I was 13, um, my parents sent me back uh, to Hungary to be there with my grandmother when she died. Mm -hmm. And during the time I was in Hungary, which was a few months, some months, three months, I don't know, four months, um, I actually went to the Hungarian State Ballet School, which was really interesting because the, they trained in Vaganova. Russian Vaganova technique was, it was um, totally kind of big and open and expressive. Mm. So I had that experience of ballet in and through another lens, I suppose. Mm. And when I did go back to Australia, um, I had also had the experience of dancing every day, mm. and I really wanted that. That's what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I had to contain myself again, but um, the memory of the big, open, expansive movement um, stayed with me. Mm. So you became a ballerina, a professional ballet dancer, which is amazing to me, knowing where you are now or where you moved into later on in your life. Yeah. Um, did you enjoy it? Did you like dancing ballet or being in such a big company? Sure. At the beginning, it was, uh, that's what I had dreamt about. And suddenly here I was, I was dancing in uh, uh, Swan Lake, uh, Sleeping Beauty, Nutcracker, Capelia. We, we did some more modern Balanchine ballets, Fokine ballets. So, you know, it was really an experience of a whole gamut of balletic vocabulary and way of presenting the body. So um, the earlier ballet is, of course, very much about story, but um, Fokin, um, Le Sophie, for instance, is very abstract. Mm. Or um, Balanchine, um, the company did Bure Fantasque, very abstract, but also a piece called Night Shadow, which has definitely has a story and an emo emo emotional kind of mm. quality to it. So um, yeah, I I uh, I loved it, uh, but then I began to um, experience the the hierarchical nature of the company, mm -hmm. the fact that it was so big, the fact that um, um, we performed a lot, we toured a lot which was partly amazing because um, it took me not only in the dreary provinces of England, but also um, to Spain, uh, including Madrid, the north of Spain, Barcelona, as well as the Far East. So it was, although I had grown up in Australia, it was my first experience of Asian culture and Asian art, mm. um, which really left a big impression on me, mm. even though I didn't follow it up for quite some years, but um, was rather curious the way it came back into my life again, mm. when I ended up starting to do the Tai Chi and get involved, getting involved in um, uh, Eastern philosophy, Eastern healing methods, and yeah. 
which is also a very different mindset than the, different. the Western, I am pretty, lift me up, I am the star um, kind of mindset of a ballet company. Well, I, I would say again that um, I don't know that it, within a ballet company it would be that different, the mindset would be that different. However, there is uh, um, another layer of, of uh, Eastern philosophy that, that, that is very different. And, and, um, and, and the martial arts, of course, are quite, um, yeah, they're, they're influential. Yeah. And, yeah. So what happened then? There was something that st was stirred inside of you that said, okay, I love dancing, but I don't like the hierarchy or I don't like even the big, like what, what changed inside of you? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one was a recognition that if I really did want to dance and um, rather than hang around uh, framing the ones who dance, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe te technically I needed to be stronger and more, um, more fulfilling that mold, mm -hmm. which I which I didn't, and I I yeah. Um, like to be a prima baller, to be a solo dancer, a principal dancer. Yeah, a principal yeah. dance. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean that was one thing, but the other thing that um, that I think was very influential was that I began seeing a lot of other kinds of work, and I began to realize that actually ballet wasn't the only way that one could dance, and there were other types of dancing that could express um, deep emotional um, and physical um, um, hu humanness <laughs> um, uh -huh. and, and, and they gave the dancer much more freedom, physical freedom. So initially it was uh, ballet derivatives like um, um, some of the companies I saw were uh, Ballet Grand Bear, still very balletic, but also very influenced by, um, uh, again, you know, choreographers who took, took ballet in slightly different directions. Um, I remember seeing Bejar and being um, really excited by the way he got men moving, but women were kind of poking around with their point shoes and their straight legs and arms and things. And, and I thought, well, wow, that's not for me. And um, we're talking, yeah. what time frame are we talking, like 1960s or? early 70s or what, what time is this um well uh i i got to england in 69 mm -hmm. and this is probably around like 71 72 mm -hmm. um by 73 I had really begun, really begun to make a shift. And, you know, I was looking, I was searching. I went to um, the place in London to, to classes there, open classes, uh, Graham, Graham Technique. And again, there were things about it that I enjoyed and things about it that didn't feel quite right, didn't feel quite like me. Um, however, it was was at the place where I saw um, someone who became very important in my life, um, uh, Gerda Geddes, we called her Pitt, 
and she did a demonstration of Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I feel I really deeply connected with something about the way she was moving and the quality of her moving. Mm -hmm. So I began to study with her, but still um, I was interested in what was around and there wasn't a lot around that was so very different from the more traditional dance model um, until uh, I began to see performances of a small experimental group called Strider that was um, um, had been uh, well, Richard Alston was the one who received the grant, the initial grant, the funding in order to start this group. Uh, but a lot of the misfits at the London School of Contemporary Dance began to make work there uh, within that group. Um, so people like... Um, Sally Potter, who ended up making amazing feminist movies. Um, she was a she was a dancer. I didn't. She know. was a dancer. Yes. Oh wow! I love yeah. her films. Yeah, she's incredible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but that's why I, now. Ah, see, there is a sense of flow, and there's a sense of movement mm -hmm. in her movies, and ah, that makes a lot yes. of sense. Yes, absolutely. Ah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, Sue, Sue Davis, Siobhan Davis, yeah. who also then went on to form her own company. But you know, she was one of those people who were wanting to um, to to make work differently to the way it was prescribed. Yeah. Um, you know, Graham is very traditional, even though her movement material, the way of moving was very personal, but the way of making work was um, along rather traditional lines. Anyway, I began to look at the work of Strider and got really interested in them. Um, but very small group. Uh, so... You know, I, I didn't really think that there was a lot of chance for me to work with them. Uh, however, um, an Australian friend of mine, um, Nanette Hassel, um, who had danced with Cunningham in New York uh, and introduced me both to Cunningham's work and Viola Farber's work. Um, she ended up moving from New York back to, uh, uh, to, to England, to London, and began to work with Strider because she was bringing Cunningham technique into the group. And um, Richard Alderson, interestingly, had a had a visual art background. So he didn't come from dance. And um, for me, it's also really interesting that many of the, um, many of the dancers, choreographers who began to make more interesting work had not come from a dance background. They'd come from a visual art or a music or a you know, whatever kind of background, or started dancing late. They didn't have the, 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 they weren't indoctrinated into, <laughs> into um, believing that, you know, that this was the one way that you could become a dancer. So yeah. it wasn't, um, it wasn't the formula set into them they created their own structures and their own um, setups right. or they were free enough to experiment with them and and just didn't have it so much um as a, there wasn't just one way of going of approaching it 
No, no, but there weren't a lot of uh, examples around. I, I, I uh, well, eventually I did start to dance with Strider, which was incredible. Um, it's at the, that time, I think we were six people, six dancers, which was um, phenomenal because each of us had some kind of um, voice and agency, although um, you know, I didn't really understand what that meant, but I could feel it. Mm -hmm. And um, people... People in the company made work and we all performed and we performed a lot. We danced a lot. Um, we also taught. As, and um, yeah, it was uh, it, it was a very, very exciting time. Um, and, and that sounds like a really big step away from the big ballet company or the big formal setup into a collaborative setting, an experimental setting. Um, probably there was some hierarchy, but more, much, much less of a hierarchy than in the big company. So it sounds like there was so it was such a different setup than in in the way that you had been dancing before. Yes, yeah, but you know, living it, you don't. Uh... You, you or or I don't know I I I didn't conceptualize it so much I you just did it. it and I was in it and I felt good and I loved what I was doing and um yeah it uh, it it opened up lots of possibilities for me both physically and um, in terms of my creative life. Yeah. But I, then, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I just think in terms of a historical perspective, this is so important because, you know, when there's contemporary dancers now, um, I think young people probably, you know, I don't know this, but I feel like oftentimes people take it so much for granted that they have so much freedom in terms of experimentation and re like research is such a normal setup in so many ways of going about creating work or working collaboratively or experimentally or interdisciplinary even and you know 40 50 years that's not actually a long time in terms of art development and and mm -hmm. what what you guys did back then and what um, yeah what happened in the 60s and in the early 70s was such a radical shift in terms of how long dance had been set up in such a traditional way and like you mentioned even even Martha Graham or even Jose Limon you know there was such a traditional way of it wasn't the same vocabulary anymore but still there was stories there were principal dancers there was lots of copying there was a clear artistic director and this breakthrough of saying no we're, we're and then later also breaking away from the stage and going into into open spaces or working with pedestrian movement. I mean that was a, such a big revolution and I think I, or I'm I'm glad to talk about it because I feel like it's such an important historical perspective also for things that maybe may, many dancers just take for granted now, many young dancers might take for granted. Yes, I mean, as you began to talk, it made me think about feminism and the the ways um, people in my generation and a little bit earlier um, were really fighting for many of the things that young women take for granted now. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that one can take things like this for granted, or even in the world, the rise of populist governments and dictators, and people don't really understand what that means. So, you know, I think none of us can take anything for granted. I think we we need to keep questioning and we need to keep being open and aware of what's happening around us. Yeah, and I feel like listening to each other's stories also. I mean, I feel like you're telling a huge story here of this mm -hmm. big, big change in this art field that has influenced so many of us. And, you know, like when you say, oh, there was six of us, 
you know i mean th th that's how it starts sometimes you know that's how big movement starts and and uh and it it it's often like i talk about this when i talk about Siggy jung and his developments like his way of looking at psychology or even creative processes like that we that we have a shadow or that we have a collective unconscious is something that's so popularized in some ways or so standardized in our somewhat psychological language but this has not this is not a long time ago this is a hundred years ago maybe that Jung started with uh with bringing into these these approaches and even his approach of like active imagination which you know his, his way of drawing from the unconscious rather than drawing something that you set out to copy or or um you know, just uh, draw something specific, this process of really investigating yourself and then creating from there. That's not a long time ago. And it's, 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 it's so, it has, it has been so implemented in so many of our fields and in our consciousness. But I think it's important to memorize that that wasn't, that wasn't how we functioned before, how society looked at art or how society even valued art or, or psychology in that way. And I, you know, for me, that's very much interconnected. Sorry, I, I took a detour through Jung, but <laughs> seemed well, Im seemed important. I, yeah, detours, detours <laughs> are interesting. <laughs> the, 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 the moments when we open up another doorway. Exactly. Or another. Yeah. So, um, I'm wondering, you know, a big chunk of your career or her your life, uh, um had to do with Trisha, Trisha Brown and, and your company life. No? Yes? <laughs> very tiny. Um, hmm? It was very tiny. It was very tiny? Okay. When I look back now, mm. Mm. It, um, I danced with Trisha for six and a half years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, however, her influence has continued for sure yes yeah. so somewhere you, sometime along this time in the 70s you went to New York and you met Trisha and um... I do but before I went to New York I actually met met someone else who um, was hugely influential in what happened and that was Mary Fulkerson Mary O'Donnell Fulkerson yeah and um she was in London still. No, she was at Dartington College. Oh. She was in England, but in Dartington College. And um, I met her because Stride of the group um, did some work, both teaching and performing at Dartington. And Mary had just started to work there. Um, so I had started to do the Tai Chi and I began to work with the friend uh, Wendy Lovett who was interested in bringing aspects of the Tai Chi into dance, into dancing. So the, this, this was moving around in me at the time. And when I met Mary, of course, she was working with release technique. Um, at that time, you know, it was more anatomically based, so very much um, uh, including the idiokinesis work that um, stemmed from Mabel Todd's thinking body. And um, what, what what that did for me was I realized that here was, well, the Tai Chi is a martial art, it's not a dance technique, but the release work was a dance technique, and it was saying so many of the same things that the Tai Chi was saying things like, I, I remember Mary being the first person who ever said in a dance class, listen to your body, which blew my mind because I had not been told to listen to my body in any other dance technique class ever before. 
um, there was time given. And I knew from having done the Tai Chi that time was of an essence in order to be able to understand where movement comes from, where it's going to, but also the, the pathway of it, the, all the micro, micro, micro movements that lie in between here and there. And is there a there that there is already the here that, you know. So um, the, the, the sense of ground, groundedness that is the only way that we can achieve lightness, um, you know, again, within the release work, I began to see that that was possible even within a non-stylized technique like the Tai Chi. Um, and at that time, the release work uh, that Mary taught well, I think she continued working with it uh, all the way through, but at that time she was very much focused on developmental movements. So we did a lot of rolling, we did a lot of crawling, a lot of squatting, uncurling, curling, um, you know, falling up, falling down, falling up. I've never even imagined that you could fall up, but suddenly I was falling up, and um, and and a certain kind of focus on alignment. How is my body aligned? Not through muscle effort or muscle tension, but through allowing my body to fall around its center line. So center line was another image that, that Mary brought in. And it was because of Mary's um, um, Mary's advice that when I get to New York, I should study with Andre Bernard, that I began to study with Andre. Mm -hmm. And it was through Steve Paxton, um, and that was also another kind of mind-blowing experience to meet up with Contact Improv mm. and to um, be an audience watching Steve improvise was another amazing experience for me that I still carry with me. But um, it was Steve who said to me, when you get to New York, make sure you call Trisha Brown and get in touch with her. So, you know, when I got to New York, um, there were these two, two threads that were mm -hmm. um, very important. That, um, that, that, that must have been just at the beginning of contact. I mean, in the early seventies, when they yeah. when these guys were just exploring, experimenting, yes. so it was super fresh and probably super exciting. Very much so. I, I yeah, seeing uh, Danny Lepkoff and um, David Woodbury was another one who was. Uh, very much involved in contact. And I remember seeing the two of them uh, working together with such close physical proximity, uh, so it's sensuous, so uh, true to their weight and their momentum. And, you know, I mean, I couldn't, um, I didn't have the words to describe it like that, but I did have the feelings that I felt when I was watching them. Um, yeah. But you had a kinesthetic response for sure. Yeah. 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 If you would like to know more about holistic dance and the Holistic Dance Institute, please visit us at our website www.holistic-dance.at. Holistic Dance is an invitation to transformation through dance, movement and touch. It was founded by me, Sabine Parzer, in 2010. It is a mix of different methods, a dynamic cross-method approach from dance pedagogical, dance and body therapeutic, systemic and holistic methods. 
We offer authentic movement, integrative contact improvisation, somatics and applied anatomy, improvisation, ecosomatics, and many more elements. I offer holistic dance workshops. I offer single sessions. I offer teachers trainings, embodiment trainings, advanced teachers tracks, year groups, and retreats. I would be very happy to see you at one of our events. And if you have any questions, please write me an email.